And when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. And if we're talking tight ends and we're going into round two, maybe round three, give me Ian Thomas, please. Just let's, I mean, let's just do the damn thing. Just based on giving his overall ability. Um, again, I like his arm. I think he can make every throw. The pick at number 12 is in. Welcome to Cover One, the NFL Draft Podcast. I am Russell Brown. Joining me on a Tuesday night, to talk the 2019 NFL Draft, the Cincinnati Bengals, and anything else that you can think of. Joe Goodberry, my good friend of the Athletic Cincinnati, is joining me. Joe, how we doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. It's kind of like, you know, all the work's been done. We're ready to go. The energy's high, but it kind of burned out a little bit. I don't know about you. Yeah, man. It's been a 10-month grind. Just put a, a top 200 big board together last uh, week, well, well, really over the weekend, but really the last 10 months. I basically know mm-hmm. how players put their shoes on. Um, and and I'm, I'm ready to take a break, but I'm also excited for like the next step because I always like after the draft, I like to pick four or five guys that I, I like their team fit, and I like breaking down how they fit. So I'll jump into the X's and O's of that. And it's oh, like, I, I like to do the opposite. I pick four or five guys that are con- going to completely bust because of the oh, fit. That's actually – I can I steal that for cover you one? Can. Actually, yeah. I, I usually pick 10 because you got to think it's probably 50-50 more than likely. Yeah. 10 is, is going on the safe side. But it, it's – you can usually – it's funny, I'll do the poll on Twitter and usually get a consensus of about five or six people that uh, are players that people are like, yeah, the fit just isn't right there. I don't know what they're doing. Now, is there ever Bengals guys on this list? Oh, yeah. John Ross was a name that came up a lot, only because I think a lot of people thought he's a reach and the injury history yes. put him in, a, in, a, in the, you know, the prospect of if, if he's healthy, we like him. But there's a lot of, a lot of busts happen because of health. Yeah, it really does. And that's, that's something that worries you about Hollywood Brown for this, this oh, class. Yeah. Um, explosive as hell. Great player yeah. overall in college. But just the injuries are certainly something. And the, the frame of 165, 170 pounds, I'm sorry, I, can't, I just can't buy into that. But uh, It makes him an outlier, right? I mean, we've got basically Deshaun Jackson, and that's it in right. the history of the NFL. Of guys, and you don't, if you're going to spend a first-round pick on Hollywood Brown, you don't want to get an okay speedster. Like, hey, you don't want to get Marquise Goodwin just because, you know, that guy is, is going to be fast and catch a few balls. You want – you're spending that first-round pick. You want him to be Deshaun Jackson fully. And really the chances of hitting that small target are so slim. Yeah, and it really is. And it's – he's a guy that I certainly think could uh, go in the first round. And I guess maybe that's where we'll start, you know, since we're talking about Hollywood Brown. Um, do you believe he's a potential first-round – I mean, tape-wise – yeah, maybe it stands out a little bit, but again, he's an outlier with the health and everything else. And yeah. maybe we don't agree with the fact of taking him in the first round off of our boards. I mean, I certainly don't. He's around the 45, 50 range on my board. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of it was because of health and stuff like that. And, and, uh, but, but overall, do you think he goes in the first round? And, and do you think maybe there's any surprise names? Do you have any surprise names for the first round of the 2019 NFL draft? I definitely think he goes first round and I don't agree with it, but uh, I do think when teams look at this and the same reason John Ross got pushed up, I think Hollywood Brown would have tore up the combine had he had that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and he, you know, he should have helped himself by eating every day, five times a day to get to <laughs> 175 pounds if he could have stomach. <laughs> but point being, uh, had he have run, I think it would be a lock first rounder, but I think he's going to go there anyways. I don't know who it is. Uh, I just think there's enough teams that seem interested in adding an explosive vertical threat really there's only a few of these guys that are like this in the NFL and there's a lot of vertical guys in different ways and I think in the league today you're seeing bigger guys that also can get deep uh the Hollywood Brown types are few and far between and I could see a team definitely pulling the trigger on them in the first round I have him actually as our number 12 receiver uh and it's wow. it, it, I'm trying to put a lot of analytics analytics into it his size like I said makes him an outlier it puts him in a low category of success his breakout age which is very important for receivers uh especially if recent data says that if you had more than 20 percent of your team's receiving output at while you're 18 19 20 that is great for your success going forward it means you're winning because you're 
already tuned as an athlete at a very young age and you're not a 22 year old beating these guys Hollywood Brown gets it ends up in the 31st percentile uh for for actually when he finally broke out and his production scores are okay they're good for the most part but I think missing time has hurt him uh especially last year so when I look at it I wish he would have tested and I probably would have liked him much more because I think if if I just change his incomplete grade there of his relative athletic score and put it in the 90th percentile he goes up pretty considerably probably to like the number seven or six on tape I have him as the number two guy so I like Hollywood Brown but other first rounders that I think would be a surprise I don't know if it's a surprise for everyone but Juan Thornhill safety for Virginia I think now that Seattle's got two first round picks makes oh yes we just talked sense. about them. really now, I, I, I'm sorry I don't mean to cut you off but we just talked about it it's Christian Page and myself my co-host uh, we just did an episode of the podcast for 30 minutes before this and we talked about Seattle making that move and yeah. him at 21 and 29. And I talked about Montez Sweat at 21, if he yep. fell that far. And he's going and, to, it seems. And it seems. And one team I continue to circle back is the Lions simply because, and mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a Lions fan, but I, sit, I circle back because there's this rumor of them potentially being aggressively looking to trade back. So let's, yes. say, let's say they want Jonah Williams, who I think they really want. He's gone at seven. He goes to the pick right. four. I could see them moving back in a team like Carolina – could want to move up in front of Buffalo to maybe get an Andre Dillard or something. So, yep. so I could see that happening and maybe at 16 Detroit takes them or 17 with the Giants. But no, at 21, yes, Seattle. And then at 29, we talked about Jonathan Abram and how they could very well be targeting both Mississippi State players. So I love yeah. that you, you brought that up because he's a great box safety. I don't, think oh. he's, I don't think he's a single high safety by any means. I thought he looked a little slow, especially at times just flipping his hips and trying to show that range. But I think in the box and that aggressiveness, teams are going to love that. And I think Seattle's certainly that team. I have him as my number one safety. And it's not a safety that in the safety class where I think one guy really stands out. But to me, he does in terms of being a safe prospect. I really like him on tape. I think the way he clicks close very fast coming down, running the alley, making tackles. I think as a former corner, you can line him up against slot guys, maybe hopefully tight ends, running backs. That would be ideal. I mean, you really don't want your – safety as good as a cover guy as he is covering a slot receiver but uh his his tape is really good like I said his production scores put him in the 96 percentile indicating he should be able to be a very productive player in the NFL relative athletic score puts him very near uh 98th percentile so PFF loved him also too I got their draft guide which is really good but Juan Thornhill comes out for me as a top 10 player in this draft I know he's not going to go there I just think he is fantastic and don't be surprised if two years from from now we go man Juan Thornhill should have went much earlier and if he goes 21 or, or later for the uh, for the for the Seahawks, then I think people will realize very quickly why they took him. Yeah, no, and it's it's going to be a lot of fun uh, to to see how it all breaks down. Um, but let's move to the Cincinnati Bengals and let's let's put a focus on on what they're going to do, and then we'll get back into some some draft talk and everything else. But right. they're they're a team at 11 that I just they are so hard to figure out because they've been so quiet almost like they, they haven't yeah. done a ton in the off season, nothing real splashy. They lost a uh, birth set. You know, they, they, they don't have, it just doesn't seem like they have everything in place to, to really take the next step. Like they're supposed to, maybe they will, but it doesn't seem like it. Um, what do you think they're going to do at 11? What's their biggest need really? What's, what's the biggest need for them? Yeah. And I think they, why they haven't been super aggressive as you, you would probably expect a team that's had three straight losing years has changed your coach uh, going with a younger guy. That's supposed to bring some excitement. I think you would see those other franchises that do the same thing. Attack free agency, look at a quarterback in round one, and it doesn't feel like the Bengals are doing either of those. So they're kind of how they've always been one foot in uh, out one foot in, and they can't really decide are they going for it this year or are they building for the future for sustainability? So I think at 11, what what's interesting to me is they have looked at a lot of edge guys this year from Montez Sweat to Rashawn Gary. And now they've got coaches too from Michigan and, and uh, Mississippi State on their staff. So I wonder with the injuries of those guys recently and even some character questions with Sweat, if they're going to say, no, we're comfortable. We know this guy. And 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 they see Sweat as a value pick because honestly on tape and, and production and athleticism, he's probably a top eight player in this draft. So I could see them looking at Sweat and saying, He's the best player available. We feel comfortable. He's our pick. I think they'd love to go linebacker if possible. The Bengals are typical for addressing their needs through free agency and not in a big way, but signing guys like John Miller, right? And Bobby Hart. And those are not good players, but what they do is they say, okay, those are our starters. At least if we find an upgrade, great. If not, those are our starters. 
and they say, well, we did not find a starter or we did not sign a guy at linebacker. So they leave one hole. They did it last year with Billy Price. And they said, no matter what, we're going to take a center at 21. And what happened is their guy, Frank Ragnall, went at 20. And they said, ah, oh, that sucks. Here's our, here's our number two guy, Billy Price. So they, they just throw out value completely in that scenario and just take their guy. The year before, it, that was uh, Corey Davis. Mike Williams goes. They say, okay, John Ross, you're next on the board. We need, we need a receiver. You're up. And so that's how they operate. And I, I think if Devin White's there, it's a home run. They, they run the card up there. They're more than yeah. a stack. Uh, I think Devin Bush is the guy that's closer in that range. Now, I, I feel what, what you hear recently, how, how people are talking, is that Bush may not be there. Mm-hmm. And number 10 seems ideal for, for Bush, right? Like the Broncos seem to be in on him. If they're not taking Drew Locke, it seems like Devin Bush, in my opinion. Now, maybe they're throwing us off. But if Bush is there, I think they jump on that pick. If he's not there, I think they say, okay, there's really no other linebacker worth it. There may not be a linebacker worth it until round three. So what do we do? We look at the offensive line. We look at defensive line. Is Sweat still there? Is Gary still there? I don't get excited about Gary. I think his production is way too low for a guy of his caliber, mm-hmm. uh, especially watching him last year on tape. I think there were just times he didn't give a shit. And that, yeah, that's exactly. scary. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I would take Sweat and hope for the best because I do think his upside is tremendous. I, I think the other scenario is they look at O-line and say, okay, is Jawan Taylor still there? Is Jonah Williams still there? I can see a scenario where neither guy is there. And then for them, it's next would probably be Andre Dillard. And you talked about maybe another team trades up for Dillard if, if uh, you know, if, if the Lions trade back or if Buffalo takes Dillard themselves. So mm-hmm. I wonder of those three, which tackle is still remaining, if any are still remaining. It's it's kind of funny if, if I, you know, when we started this process, I thought two, maybe three quarterbacks could go top 10 if I was thinking Drew Locke was going to go 10. And mm-hmm. now it's how many actually go? Is it just Kyler Murray number one? And recently we're talking, is Kyler Murray, Murray even going number one? So I want as many quarterbacks to go in the top 10 as possible. That way it pushes one of those guys to them at 11. If not, I could see a scenario where the Bengals say, all right, we trade back. And then the, the, the targets get to be, is it Christian Wilkins? Is it, is it Cody Ford? Um, And for me, that doesn't, that's not as exciting. I'm not a big fan of either guy. I think those are solid picks with, with Ford's got a little bit of upside, but I think he'd be better as a guard. And Wilkins is just a okay guy that had a lot of production, almost 24 years old. So, I don't get excited over that. I would love a Brian Burns. If they want to go with, a, with an edge guy to go opposite Carl Lawson and play more multiple fronts, I think Brian Burns would be perfect for that. I just – they never drafted an edge guy under 250 pounds, and I think he barely put on that 249. It looks like he played less than that, and I think that would scare him away a little bit. So, as of right now, I think the way it's going to play out, it could be Von, uh, Montez Sweat or it could be the best offensive tackle on the board. And you would think that's probably like the maybe the most obvious choice for them, or that's just like their biggest need, you think? I don't think you go by need, right? You have your needs uh, because I don't think Sweat is comes in and walks in and, and is a starter right now. They drafted Sam Hubbard last year in the third round they like. They drafted Jordan Willis two years ago, or three years ago that they like. And right. Carl Lawson has been good, but he got hurt last year. Carlos Dunlap is a starter. So why draft a sweat? Well, you kick one of those guys inside and nickel and you rush with three defensive ends and they've done that before. They're going to stand one of them up and move them around a little bit. So right. sweat may not be an instant starter or even a Rashawn Gary wouldn't be. And I'm not even sure a tackle, if it's Andre Dillard, does he come in and just step in and beat Bobby Hart at right tackle? And I'm saying this, I, knowing how bad Bobby Hart is, <laughs> but knowing very well that Dillard is a left tackle that is a finesse player that needs development in the run game, I believe, and still some work on his hands and core strength. So I like Dillard a lot, but does he walk in and just play a new position when he needs development time at left tackle as it is? And he's all the way a future left tackle, in my opinion. So how do you, yeah. how do you manage that? If it's John Williams, I think he beats uh, Bobby Hart. If it's Juwan Taylor, he handily beats Bobby Hart at right tackle because I think he's ideal prototypical right tackle. Right. So, you know, it depends on who it is and if it's need or not. I think need-wise, they want a linebacker. If, if Bush is there, I think he's the pick. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. It's it like, and I'm with you. It seems like as if the last few days it was maybe the Broncos going quarterback and Drew Locke this entire time, and now it's like, oh, they're they're going Devin Bush if he's there. And it just it seems like very. I don't want to bash your team, but it certainly seems like Bengals like like two linebackers that they could use are both going to be off the board by pick eleven, and they're going to be kind of stuck twiddling their thumbs saying, what do we do? Um, if Dwayne Haskins was there, would you would you be standing on the table saying, hey, I want this guy? Would you want I, a, a guy underneath Andy Dalton? Me, I would not for Dwayne Haskins. I would be on the table for a quarterback. I just don't know that it's Haskins. I think 
Haskins has a lot of issues on film when I watch him. I, I think when it, when things go off script, now here, I'll start with the good. He runs the system, and once the system was married to what he does, and I think that took about six weeks or so, mm-hmm. once it was married with him and they, they had an idea of, of each other, I think Haskins ran that offense like Phillip Rivers at, at NC State. You know what I mean? Like he was perfect accuracy-wise, dishing the ball out to the right guy. Uh, it just was a machine, and it ran very, very well. I think – when he had to go off script, and what I mean by that is, do you have to move your feet in the pocket? And, right. and do you have to go to your second or third read? Uh, yeah. Do you have to create and make something happen? He looks like a completely different person. And I think when he ran and ran a, a, a four of them five seconds and didn't do any of the other drills really, came out like a subpar athlete, I think I was like, yeah, that makes sense of why he struggles so bad if, if he has to come off his launch point, launch point or come off his mark and, and try and make a throw or make a play. And I think he just struggles in, in that phase. And I don't like his deep accuracy or his aggressiveness to push the ball down the field. I think he's very quick to go to the open guy and keep the chains moving. Now, that's a good thing. Coaches will value that, I think, from an evaluation perspective. I look at it and say, I wonder what his upside is. Is he Derek Carr, who is a fine starter, but I think even the Raiders would be open to upgrading if the opportunity presented itself. So yeah. uh, I think their their strengths and weaknesses are very similar, kind of very similar to Andy Dalton at the same time. But I think if Haskins went back to Ohio State and produced the same way he did this year with his flaws, he would be considered a top five pick, hands down. And I say that because – on the spectrum he's on, like he's not on the Patrick Mahomes, Baker Mayfield spectrum, right? He, those guys are very calm and cool. They can create plays off script, and it's it's nothing to them. Plus they're cerebral, cerebral with strong arms, with accuracy, and they're aggressive down the field. He's on the spectrum, and this is going to sound crazy, but of Drew Brees, Tom Brady. And I'm not saying he is that guy. What I mean is those guys don't do well off script either. Now they're 20-year veterans at this point, and they can <laughs> handle it. But what I mean is they run their system so well and with such precision and accuracy that those other plays, those off script plays don't affect them very much, maybe a few times each game. And you can win a lot of games with a guy like that. So I think if Haskins did it again for two years, people would have way less reservation with him and say, okay, he's our guy. But I think a lot of the questions teams have are one year starter. And you look at the history of one year starters and it's not great in the NFL. There's just not enough of them that have come out and have had success. And I, I guarantee it's scaring teams away. Yeah, and I I mean, like, and I guess that's what makes Kyler Murray so different compared to Dwayne Haskins because his ability to go off script. But I think that's something that scared me so much with just both guys in general, like the one-year ability of just playing at college and really nothing else beyond that. And, that like, that was just something that scared me a little bit, and that's why they, you know, Dwayne Haskins is at 24 on my board and and Kyler Murray's at 26. Like, there's not much that separated them, but um, if if – obviously if those guys are off the board or even if they are on the board or whatever, let's say there is every quarterback on the board, whatever, who's the quarterback that you would want them to take? Is it a guy in the first round or is it a guy maybe like a Ryan Finley in, in round three or, or whoever? I think it would be Kyler if I could choose anyone because of the excitement and the X factor he brings. I do think he's super efficient within that offense and an offense that, honestly took advantage of bad defenses and created a lot of space. And honestly, if your team in the NFL isn't doing what Oklahoma is doing, you guys probably need to update your offense a little bit. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to criticize him so much for being so efficient, but yeah. uh, when things did break down, so he ran his offense to pre- precision of the, the highest level, but when things broke down and he had to do what he had to do, he created plays at a high rate and, He's got a cannon arm. He's aggressive downfield. He's He can flip the wrist, and that ball's accurate 50 yards downfield. And as a runner, he's as exciting as anybody we've seen in a very long time. I mean, you, he may go up there with Mike Vick as a college runner. And for me, that's just a crazy mix of talent. And I think coaches would salivate at that opportunity. And that's why, yes, he's a one-year starter. And honestly, if it wasn't Cliff Kingsbury and his connection at, at number one, I do wonder where Kyler would go. And I I wonder how many teams would actually be interested. I think the old school teams would still say, nope, Daniel Jones for us, you know, or Drew Locke for us. And I think that's a mistake. But uh, so if I – you can't take those guys off the board. And for the Bengals, I want them to take a developmental guy uh, or a guy in the second, third round beyond. I like Will Greer a lot. His only knock for me is that he's 24 years old. And the the history of 24-year-old quarterbacks is even bleaker than when you're starting quarterbacks. Right. Uh, but I like him going off script. I like him creating plays. I like his gunslinger mentality. Now he makes a lot of mistakes while doing it. But I th- I'd rather corral a guy back 
in, in rather than try and unlock somebody that really hesitates to do these type of things. And, and it was a simplistic offense, I think, for the most part. Uh, I think one and a half years, or you know, after the transfer, one and a half years starting, uh, Greer has high production. And I, if if he wasn't 24, I think he'd be talked about as a maybe late first round pick. Uh, after that, a complete shot in the dark because his his all of his analytics say he's not going to succeed. Uh, but Tyree Jackson from Buffalo would be fun. I mean, it yeah. just, I mean, just, we've never seen an athlete like, I mean, he's a 99.9 percentile quarterback. He would make an awesome tight end, I'm sure. But he's got a cannon. He throws, they, they're, everything's vertical at Buffalo. It's either vertical or check it down. And sometimes there was no check down too because they were giving him help. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was push the ball downfield constantly. His average depth per target was the highest amongst that, anyone in this class. So you know why his statistics were low, but still his his production numbers say, He's never going to be anything at all. But I think for fun and X factor and bringing him into preseason and just watch him then, I think would be worth a fifth round pick or so. Yeah, I, I really like that you brought up Will Greer. I think he would be a lot of fun behind Andy Dalton. Um, I, I think just that mix would be good. And I, I agree. I think there's certainly flaws with him. He is fun to watch uh, with that gunslinger mentality. And I think maybe Cincinnati would be like a perfect fit for him. Uh, maybe it would have to take like a second round pick to do it, which is a little rich for me, but according to, you know, everything that it sounds like he could be even a late first round pick right now, despite yeah. being 24. So I don't know. It'll be interesting. Um, and I'm glad you brought up a tight end uh, or, or bringing up tight ends. And I, I do want to ask you that, and then we'll, we'll get on out of here and I'll, I'll let you get back to your Tuesday night. Um, but with tight ends, they, they lost Tyler Croft. They have CJ Uzama. Uh, they've got Tyler Eifert back for a year. Is there any chance maybe in the first round or even in the second round because of this tight end class being so good, like Herb Smith, Chase Sternberger, and of course the, the Iowa guys, is there a tight end that you think that they could target at 11 or in the second round or any, any player in specific you like specifically? I love the uh, TJ Hawkinson and I'd take him hands down at 11. I think it's a perfect tight end prospect as good as you're, you're going to find ever. And mm-hmm. so for me, uh, I would love it, but there's been no inclination, no buzz or anything from the Bengals about tight end, especially at 11. Uh, in fact, I have on my board, one guy they had contact or had a visit with, and it was Jay Sternberger uh, who I like. And if it's third, fourth round range, I really like him. I don't like him in round two. I think there's a big gap again, like linebacker. We, uh, I just said where I don't, next guy may go late second, early first round at linebacker. I think we could see the same thing at tight end. Now, some people like Irv Smith, but I think Irv Smith is a risky pick in, in a lot of ways by the way he tested and produced. So for me, my next guy, my number three guy is Josh Oliver from San Jose, and he looks like a natural receiver, easy mover, uh, good hands. He can split out wide and do a lot of things. He tested well, produced very well. I think for me, I, I build a uh, threshold for the Bengals at each position. And, you know, if they like receivers that run a, a, a seven one zero on the three cone, or they don't draft them a hundred percent of the receivers, they draft the last 23 have run at least a seven one zero on the three cone. Right. Wow. So, you know, you can, I've got these for every position and I got averages for every position too. So like the average guy at receiver runs a six nine zero. So you can see they have a very tight fit there at receiver, what they like. And that's their, that's their strongest thing. But at tight end, the guy who comes out completely average, I mean, within a, quarter inch and a pound is uh, Josh Oliver. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at third round range and they pick high third round, if that's where Oliver comes off the board. And I, I think there's other guys that fit. I think they could use a wide tight end, uh, you know, cause Oliver's more of a move tight end and someone that can compliment Eifert and Uzama. Cause those guys are both kind of move guys. Uh, so I, I think that it could be a Foster Moreau or a Drew Sample or maybe a Caden Smith or Trevon Wesco. One of those guys as, as day three picks. I like Foster Moreau of LSU because uh, I think he, there's much more up untapped potential in his game. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I think, yes, tight end's going to happen. I just don't know if they want to go as high as third round or if they let that simmer and, and find a fit more than a good prospect. Tons of great stuff, man. I, I love that you brought up Josh Oliver, who – I liked watching on tape. I thought there was times that he struggled with drops and he showed that at the senior bowl too. Um, But he's a mismatch. I mean, he, he creates mismatches because of his size and he's fluid. Uh, Drew sample to me, best blocking tight end in the class. I don't care what anybody says. He's phenomenal. Um, Only one drop I think in his career. Yeah. I mean, he's, and he's got like untapped potential. I think he could be a, a day three pick. And then in three years, we're talking about him as your starting tight end potentially in fantasy. Maybe that's a little rich, but screw it. Um, no, I don't think it is because his relative athletic score, the way he tested, puts him in the 91st percentile. I think there's a lot there that hasn't been used yet. 
Yeah, he's and he's. I'll tell you, I talked to him at Senior Bowl. Great guy, very down to earth guy, very uh, open to talking about what he he does to become a better blocker, and he takes so much pride in that. So I would love that as well. But uh, seriously, I, I don't have any more questions. There's so much great stuff that we talked about. So Joe, where can we find you on Twitter, and where can we find your work? Yeah, the best place to find me and talk to me, and I'm always open to conversation, is on Twitter, at Joe Goodberry. Uh, you can also find my work at the Athletic Cincinnati and the Lockdown Bengals podcast, Daily Bengals podcast. So uh, you can find me a lot of places. Guys, check him out. It's always great stuff. He also posts pictures of his sick game room and everything else. That's that right. he's got. It's amazing. I'm incredibly jealous. So Come for the football. Stay for everything else. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, Joe, thank you so much. He's Joe Goodberry. I am Russell Brown. Again, you can find me on Twitter at Russ NFL Draft. So until next time, this is Cover One, the NFL Draft Podcast.